The Communist Chinese government is ramping up its aggression toward Taiwan this week, and it appears that China is now openly violating its agreement with the Vatican again. Joining me to discuss all of this and much more, president of the Population Research Institute, author of The Bully of Asia, Stephen Mosher. Stephen, thanks for being here. Uh, the Chinese government has installed a new bishop of Shanghai last Tuesday. Without the Vatican's approval, it's a total violation of the Vatican-China agreement. Bishop Joseph Shin Bin of Hyman was appointed to the Diocese of Shanghai by the state-sanctioned bishops' conference. Now, according to the Vatican spokesman, Matteo Bruni, the Holy See had been informed a few days prior to the move of the decision by the Chinese authorities to transfer the bishop, but only learned of the installation by the media the day it happened. In a recent article, Pope Francis's biographer Austin Ivory writes, the basis of the Holy See's 2018 agreement with China over bishops is the fruit of Benedict XVI's 2007 letter to the Chinese people, seeking collaboration and dialogue. The agreement is a first imperfect step, yet has borne fruit. Bishops are all now in communion with Rome. The Pope is the last word over episcopal appointments. And Chinese Catholics are far less likely now to be accused of loyalty to a foreign power. Steve, your reaction, and is any of that true? Well, I don't know where to start, Raymond, because it's all false. First of all, uh, the idea that, that Benedict XVI, may God rest his soul, is somehow responsible for this flawed agreement between the Chinese Communist Party and the Vatican is nonsense. Uh, we all recall that Pope Benedict broke off negotiations with the Chinese Communist Party because he was afraid, uh, based on good evidence, long-standing evidence, that they would violate any agreement they signed. That is also what I told, of course, Cardinal Pietro Perlin, the Cardinal Secretary of State, back in the summer of 2018. I said, before he mm. signed the agreement, I said, you must understand that the Chinese Communist Party has a history of violating every agreement it has signed uh, internationally, uh, almost without exception. They will violate this one. The agreement will be used against Chinese Catholics and will not benefit them, but will ultimately redound to their to their harm. And what I what I didn't say, because what I didn't know at the time was if the agreement would be kept secret, which makes everything right. worse because the poor Chinese Catholics don't know what it says. All they know is what the Chinese Communist Party told them that it says. And what the Chinese Communist mm. Party told them what, that it says is that they must all join the Catholic Patriotic Association. Uh, they must all, uh, you know, swear loyalty to their local bishop, whether it's assigned by the Chinese Communist Party or approved by Pope Francis. So that's what they've been told. And I believe that the Sino Vatican Agreement has done its work. In other words, four years later, the underground church has been effectively annihilated. All of the Catholics were forced by the understanding of the Sino Vatican Agreement they were given by the Chinese Communist Party to come out and register with the government. Now the government knows who they are, where they are, and is surveilling them and controlling them. And they've just tightened the regulations on religious activity in China once again. You can't go to mass in China, Raymond, unless you apply every time on an app on your phone for permission. If you set foot inside the door of a church without permission on any given Sunday, uh, you're violating the regulations and, and you'll be punished. Hmm. Uh, Stephen, how many Catholics have to die or lose their faith in the name of this dialogue? That is the, that is the golden calf that everyone, from the top to the bottom, everyone who apologizes for this agreement, they say, well, this is in the name of dialogue. You have to begin somewhere. It's imperfect. Doesn't dialogue usually include two participants, one that's alive and can talk back? Well, it, it certainly does, and dialogue requires two sides. And the only, the only side that's been making concessions and trying to reach an agreement and trying to be conciliatory is the Vatican, which is all well and good if there was any sort of reciprocity, if there was any sort of response from the Chinese Communist Party. I'm afraid that what's happened is similar to what happened in 1958 during the anti rightist campaign. People may remember there was something that Chairman Mao said, uh, let, a, let a hundred flowers bloom, let, let a hundred schools mm -hmm. of thought contend. 
He privately said, I only said that to lure the snakes out of their holes so we could cut their heads off. I'm afraid that the Chinese Communist mm. Party only signed the Sino-Vatican Agreement so that he could lure Catholics out of the underground church. And once the Communist Party knows where they are and who they are, it can then annihilate, annihilate the church in China by, by closing in the walls on even the above-ground church. This appointment of the Bishop of Shanghai, the two most important seas in China are the Sea of Beijing, the capital, and the Sea of Shanghai, which is the commercial center for the country. And to name Bishop Shunbin to be the head of the Sea of Shanghai without even notifying the Vatican shows, I think, that the, uh, the Sino-Vatican Agreement is now, whatever it once was, is now clearly a dead letter. Even, even the Vatican uh, had nothing to say, no defense against this obvious violation of what was supposed to be an agreement over the appointment of bishops. Well, that's now happened several times. Last fall, November, it right. happened when, in, in Jiangxi, where they appointed a bishop without notifying the Vatican. And the Vatican scrambled to say, well, you know, we're talking to the China. They, they, they haven't offered any excuse this time. So I think even they know that, uh, that the jig is up. Meanwhile, the situation on the ground in China has only gotten worse for the faithful. Churches have been destroyed. People are harassed. Uh, their, their faith is being conscripted and, and stamped out. Does the Vatican need to pull out of this non-deal at this point, or at least admit, Steve, that this was a huge, huge error, and that because of their action, we have dead Catholics and a, and a squashed underground church in China, which is exactly what our friend Cardinal Zen told them would happen, by the way. Yes, uh, and, and he was absolutely right. He's been right all along. Uh, he, of course, was involved in the early negotiations in the 90s and under Pope Benedict, and uh, he has been one of the foremost critics of this current agreement, uh, quite rightly so. Uh, the agreement is a dead letter. I believe the terms of the agreement should be made public. And the Vatican should simply say that we're terminating the agreement because uh, the Chinese Communist Party have, has violated the terms of it. Now, I don't believe that things could get any worse for the Catholic Church in China, quite frankly, Raymond. And I say that because now in China, all religious activity has to promote the Communist Party line, has to promote the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party's ideology, and has to promote the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, which means core leader, dictator, president for life, Xi Jinping. You have to do those things. And we are now at the point in China where I believe that homilies are going to be written by Communist Party of Pratchiks, making sure that the priests from the pulpit say those things. We know that the Bible in China now has been rewritten to conform to Communist right. Party doctrine. So you have stories in the Bible like the woman caught in adultery, where Jesus comes upon men about ready to stone the woman to death and and says, let you among you who is without sin cast the first stone, and they all go away, and he forgives the woman. In the Chinese Communist Party's version of that story, uh, Jesus asked them, uh, you know, to, to uh, let you among you who is without sin cast the first stone. But then when they all go away, the Communist Party says that our Lord stones the woman to death himself, which is a total, total fraud and sham. But that's what uh, the Chinese now are being forced to read in the Bibles that they're being hand given by the Chinese Communist Party. No, no, it's it's it breaks my heart. We're, we've report. We're probably the only broadcaster that has reported that, Steve, and has been doing so consistently. The the distortion of the word of God. If that's your primary job as a church to convey the word of God to His people and to bring them to salvation. When you can't make good on that one promise, what are you doing? And I, I, it does boggle the mind and breaks the heart, really, reading those stories and seeing these homilies that have leaked out of China. It's, uh, you know, we, we should pray for these people. We should do so every day, as I do. Um, Steve, the Chinese launched three days of large-scale military drills in response to the Taiwanese president meeting with U.S. lawmakers early last week at the Reagan Library. Uh, these military drills included China's military practicing blockades and releasing an animated simulation of how China could attack Taiwan. Now, Steve, we have seen Chinese military drills in the past near Taiwan, but these drills were played out on state-run TV 
in China and even shown on big screens in major Chinese cities. What message are the Chinese communists looking to send here? And how soon do you think a Chinese attack on Taiwan could be? Well, you know, I have a rather unique perspective on this because I was an officer of the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War. I sailed through the Taiwan Straits uh, many times on board different ships. I also lived on Taiwan mm -hmm. for several years. In fact, I lived about two miles uh, uh, from the main beach where any invasion force would be landing. Uh, Taiwan is not an easy island to conquer uh, because the east coast is all rugged mountains and the west coast is uh, is mudflat. So there are very few beaches on which an invading force could actually land. So it's an easily defensible island. But we have to be clear uh, about our mm. intention to help Taiwan defend itself. And, and so far, we've been delaying shipments to Taiwan of the necessary defensive equipment they would need to defend themselves against a Chinese armada. As to when China would attack, it could happen any time. But Xi Jinping, dictator for life, has said that the People's Liberation Army must prepare by 2027 to launch an invasion. Now, I wouldn't take that uh, particular calendar date to heart, because if your enemy tells you they're going to invade in 2027, they might be planning on invading tomorrow and trying to let you mm -hmm. give you a sense that you have a little breathing room when, in fact, you may not. China and Taiwan separated in 1949, following a civil war. However, the current Chinese government has said the island is obligated to rejoin the mainland by force, if necessary. And they threatened that if President Tsai met with U.S. officials, it could lead to war. Now, this is the president of Taiwan at the Reagan Library last Wednesday. Watch. It is no secret that today, the peace that we have maintained and the democracy which we have worked hard to build are facing unprecedented challenges. We once again find ourselves in a world where democracy is under threat and the urgency of keeping the beacon of freedom shining cannot be understated. Steve, it sounds like she has every intention to keep Taiwan independent and not end up like Hong Kong. But can the Taiwanese people fight China? And should allies be preparing for that Chinese invasion? Well, well first of all, let, let's remember that President Tsai is a democratically elected president of Taiwan. The majority of the people mm -hmm. on Taiwan, who consider themselves to be Taiwanese, by the way, and not Chinese, voted to put her in office, and she represents their voice. She's speaking for them. Uh, Taiwan has now had been a full-fledged democracy for over 30 years. It has had five, six presidential elections, peaceful transfer of power from one political party to another. The ultimate test of a democracy is a peaceful transfer of power. 78 percent of the people on Taiwan say they would fight in the event of a Chinese invasion of the island. And also remember this, a little history. Uh, Taiwan has never been a part of the People's Republic of China. It was a Japanese colony from 1895 to 1945. Then it was part of the Republic of China. And that's where Chiang Kai-shek's forces retreated to in 1949 after losing the civil war on the mainland. But the Communist Party, which rules mainland China, has never ruled Taiwan. And the Taiwanese people now, quite frankly, if there were a free and open vote, uh, they would only get uh, a small percentage of the population. Nobody on Taiwan effectively wants to join mainland China. They want to have peaceful relations, of course. They don't want to be in a fighting war. Uh, they want to trade with, right. with mainland China, but they certainly don't want to, uh, to be a part of it. So the, the, the wishes of the people on Taiwan need to be respected, and, and we need, I think, to, to stand with them. There are economic reasons to do that, because Taiwan manufactures most of the chips in the world. There are security reasons right. to do that, because Taiwan is part of the cont island containment uh, of China that begins in South Korea and goes through Japan, down through the Philippines, Taiwan, and down into the South China Sea, where our allies are uh, Australia and increasingly India. So if we lose Taiwan, uh, China, the People's Liberation Army, has open access to the Pacific Ocean, and their next stop would be, I don't know, Hawaii.
Hmm. During the Taiwanese president's visit to the U.S., House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Steve, said of the relations between the U.S. and Taiwan this. The friendship between the people of Taiwan and America is a matter of profound importance to the free world. And it is critical to maintain economic freedom, peace, and regional stability. Steve, does the Biden administration have any influence on China? I mean, I know Biden said he would dispatch military before they walked it back, should China invade Taiwan. But what's the real story here? Well, the, the real story is no one knows what our aging president would do in the event of a, a Chinese attack on Taiwan. And no one knows who would actually be making that decision, sadly, because it doesn't seem like uh, President Biden knows what the U.S. current policy is, because three times he said we would defend Taiwan, and three times an anonymous White House official has walked that back. So uh, who would make the call to defend Taiwan? I don't know. But what we should be doing now is, is not thinking about an actual invasion. We should be preempting that invasion by arming Taiwan to the teeth. We should make Taiwan into such a porcupine that China would not dare touch it. And it would be fairly easy to help Taiwan defend itself against an invasion by providing anti-ship missiles. Uh, we're currently, however, depleting our armories by sending everything, virtually everything we have uh, to Ukraine. And uh, apparently, according to the latest uh, games that we've carried out, war games that we've carried out, our inventory of things like anti-ship missiles would only last a week in the event of conflict. But as I say, we should be thinking here of deterrence. We should be thinking here of peace through strength, which, of course, was President Reagan's mantra. And instead, we seem to be, 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 be confused about what our role would be and, and how important Taiwan is in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, well, it's certainly in our national interest, given all the semiconductors for these electric cars and devices everybody relies on. This is where the majority of them come from in the world. We only make, what, 12 percent of them here any longer in the United States. So it is of major national importance. Forget the strategic importance that you pointed out a moment ago. Last month, China's President Xi Jinping and Russian President Putin signed an agreement which they say brings their ties into a, quote, new era of cooperation. And they're working toward what they call responsible dialogue to resolve the Ukraine crisis. President Xi said the following. We hope that the strategic partnership between China and Russia will, on the one hand, uphold international fairness and justice, and on the other hand, promote the common prosperity and development of our countries. Fairness and justice, Steve. How did this administration and the world allowed these two countries to join forces? And what kind of a threat does this pose to the U.S. and the international order? Well, those of us who are uh, old enough to remember the 1950s when the Sino-Soviet bloc existed, where China and the Soviet Union were working together to advance the spread of communism, know what a grave threat that combined power can be. I mean, it's a power capable of dominating Eurasia, uh, which is Europe and Asia, which is the world island, and from there, of course, capable of dominating the rest of the world. I have, have argued mm -hmm. in uh, for decades that our primary, one of our primary foreign policy goals should be to keep China and Russia divided. We now inadvertently have blundered into uniting them. And this happened, of course, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Vladimir Putin, as you recall, visited Beijing and signed at that time six agreements uh, forging closer cooperation between the two Asian giants. Now that cooperation is getting even closer. And it seems that uh, China is now contemplating not just sending spare parts for Russian weapon systems, but perhaps sending entire weapon systems to Russia to help its invasion of Ukraine. And of course, I'm very much afraid that while we are distracted by the situation in Ukraine, instead of working uh, towards peace, as we should be, uh, that we will see other actors, China itself, move against Taiwan, perhaps North Korea move against South Korea, perhaps Syria and Iran mm -hmm. attacking Israel. 
Uh, now is a time when bad actors will be seizing upon American weakness and American distraction, I think, to advance their own interest in the world. And that's not, uh, that's not good for us. No. And, uh, and look, you were on the forefront of warning about the Chinese hegemon, this idea that they saw themselves as preeminent in the world, and now we're seeing them as preeminent in the world. Last month, China negotiated a deal in Beijing to bring together Saudi Arabia and Iran. Now, this came as a real surprise to most in the world, especially in the U.S., which has been a key player in the region. What is China's end game in the Middle East, Steve? And by get, get, gaining control over not only Russia, Russian territory, but having a hand and a major influence in the Middle East, what challenges does that pose to the United States? Well, well China is setting up a network of what I call Sino states. Uh, those are countries where the governments have been bribed or compromised or corrupted into working with China to undermine the current international order, which is led by the United States, and replace it with a Beijing-centered mm. international order, which will be obviously inimical to U.S. interests. And, and it, is, it is a reflection of the weakness of the Biden administration that they were able to drive a wedge between Saudi Arabia, uh, which historically for decades has been an ally of the United States and the Middle East, and in fact forge and peace agreement over Yemen between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Obviously, they're, 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 they have uh, view each other across the, the Sunni-Shia divide, right? Two major camps of the Islamic faith. And they historically have been, have been enemies within the Middle East. Now for China to broker a deal between the two of them suggests that, uh, that it is China now that in the Middle East whose word will carry more weight rather than the United States. And I have to say at this point that the Biden administration has not only uh, criticized Saudi Arabia and driven it into China's arms, it has also been unsupportive of Netanyahu and, and, and Israel, which of course emboldens Israel's enemies in the Middle East, Syria and uh, Hamas and Iran, of course, to move against Israel at this time. So uh, weakness is destabilizing not just in the Far East vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan or in the, the Korean Peninsula. It's destabilizing in the Middle East as well. And, and the, yeah. the underlying motive here, I think, for Saudi Arabia was China has promised to give it a nuclear technology if Saudi Arabia agrees to accept Chinese currency instead of the U.S. dollar for oil purchases. Hmm. So this undermines dollar supremacy. At the same time, it enables Saudi Arabia to get what it has long wanted, and that is access to the technology that may enable it to build nuclear weapons. So among other things, the Chinese Communist Party is engaging, I think, in long-term nuclear proliferation around the world, which will only destabilize wow. things further. But these are not good signs no, it, for the United States. The weakening no, of the dollar, the weakening of the international yeah, and even our allies in Europe are now abandoning us. You got France going its own way, Germany going its own way. I mean, but at least we have Ireland. <laughs> He's holding on to Ireland, Steve. Uh, I want to get to a piece you wrote in the New York Post about how China is working to gain economic dominance around the world. Uh, th there are several countries from the South Pacific to South America whose ports and railroads, resources, even their economies, are in China's pockets. You refer to them as Sino states, as you did a moment ago. How did places like Sri Lanka and Ecuador become so deeply in debt to China? Well, China is uh, has been now for some time touting something it calls the Belt and Road Initiative, the New Silk Road, and it has a land uh, aspect and it has a sea aspect, and so it has invested in port facilities in over 100 countries, uh, and that includes Sri Lanka. And what it did in Sri Lanka is kind of a model for how it operates in dozens of countries. It went to Sri Lanka and said, you know, you have um, a national debt. Uh, we will loan you a billion dollars to build a first-class port. And if you sign the agreement, we will, we will give you the money. We will also send over construction crews so you can pay us back the money we loan you, and you will wind up with a port that will generate revenue. Well, it turns out that no one did a market analysis to see if the port idea was really 
economically sustainable. And so the port loses money. Sri Lanka is unable to pay back the loan. And then you read, you know, Clause 28, I'm making the number up, uh, of the contract written in small print, which says that if you fail to pay back the loan, the port reverts to Chinese control. The tragedy each time I listen to you and every time I read your writings and, and those of others is that the Vatican has helped enable this bullying that you've written about for years and the conquering of the world by China. That is um, really astounding to me, given all we know. Uh, Steve, thanks, as always, for being here. The latest edition of Bully of Asia by Stephen Mosier, really the definitive work on China's plans for global dominance, still available in bookstores everywhere and online. And you can follow Steve on Twitter at Stephen W. Mosier. Thank you, my friend. Thank you.